Here's 10 cycling myths that aren't true. Number one, base layers make you cooler. It's another layer. Why would it make you cooler? People seem to think it's something to do with wicking away sweat, but there's never been a study to prove this. There's a few pieces of relevant research, but most of them conclude that even summer base layers make you warmer. The general consensus is that bare skin is gonna keep you the coolest, which funnily enough, we found to be true. When we cycled across Death Valley in the middle of summer, it was like 50 degrees and jerseyless was definitely the coolest option. Turns out you get sunburnt though. So it might not be the best option. One of the studies found that summer base layers are only incrementally warmer than no base layer at all. So if you want all the benefits of a base layer, like modesty, a very thin layer of protection if you unfortunately have a crash, then you could consider a very thin summer one. I personally never use a base layer because it's a really annoying layer that you can't take off while you're riding. So I prefer to wear things like a gilet on top, which you can unzip and stuff in your pocket. That's a vest for American viewers. Or a rain jacket, if you want sleeves. Bike helmets make you safer. I know this is a controversial topic. However, there is research that suggests wearing a bike helmet actually makes you less safe when you're out riding your bike. There was a study done in Australia by the University of Queensland and Flinders University, it's odd word that, found that people wearing safety equipment like high-vis vests and helmets were more likely to be perceived as not human or dehumanized than if they were wearing nothing at all. They found that cyclists wearing helmets were perceived to be less human than those that were wearing no helmet, and also found that cyclists wearing helmets to be less human than those wearing a cap. So a helmet makes you non-human. The findings are worrying because by dehumanizing cyclists, there's a tendency to associate hostility and aggressive behavior towards them, which is not what we want. I'm not saying don't wear a helmet, but it's very interesting the impact of what safety wear does to how people see us as cyclists on the road. What's the solution? I don't know. What I do know is I don't want to get hit by a car or have an accident or have a car aggressively attacking me with their vehicle because that's not good. Think about it. Wear normal clothes maybe, I don't know. Skinny tires are better. There's less surface area touching the ground. They're super skinny so they cut through the air better. So they must be faster, right? wrong. Firstly, roads are very rarely completely smooth. So that's why there's been a move towards wider tires from manufacturers and riders in the last few years. There's research ongoing about vibration loss and how tires skip over bumps. High pressure skinny tires may actually slow you down in some scenarios and wider tires at lower pressure could make the rider more comfortable, therefore saving you energy. And more importantly, in my opinion, make the rider significantly less grumpy and uncomfortable at the end of a four hour ride. You have to think of the bigger picture here. We're not always riding on Hollywood tarmac. Add on to that, wheel manufacturers have been making wheels wider and wider over the last few years too. So if you're riding a modern wheel, like a Zip, an Envy, parkour, they're designed to work with wider tires. So they sit nice and flush and therefore they are more aerodynamic. What are these? 28s. Aerodynamics don't matter uphill. The faster you ride, the more aerodynamic drag becomes a problem. So if you're riding slowly uphill, it doesn't matter as much. That's true. But how slow have you got to be going? At over 10 miles an hour, aerodynamic drag becomes the dominant force you're walking against. But at speeds below that, it never becomes zero. Now there's a million factors here. How fit you are, how heavy you are, wind speed, what's the average gradient of your climb? Are you riding with other people? Too much to go into on a tips video like this, but I would urge you to check out some great articles on Bike Rumor, the Silco website, and on AeroCoach that go into this stuff in massive detail. But the crux of my point is this. If you're gonna ride seven, eight, nine mile an hour uphill, paying attention to aerodynamics will almost certainly make you faster. And I don't mean dropping a load of cash on expensive equipment and fancy base layers with bubbles on. I mean opting to draft the wheel of the rider in front of you, or opting to sit on the drops instead of the tops and push your head down a little bit. Opting to use free techniques like that will make you quicker. You have to ride hard to get faster. Incorrect. If you look at Siler's hierarchy of training needs, you can see that volume is the most important thing. This is why professional bike riders put in so many miles and hours on the bike. Most sports scientists use a system of zones, either power or heart rate zones, depending on the equipment the rider has. Zone one being the easiest, right up to zone five or six, depending on the model. Zone two training, which is pretty low intensity, has some dramatic effects on the body. Here's what everybody's favorite coach Ken has to say. There are two ways to signal your body to improve your endurance. 
High intensity training or high volume training. Both of these activate the master switch and upregulate the amount of PGC1 alpha. This master switch upregulates mitochondrial biogenesis, the amount of slow twitch muscle fibers, fat oxidative capacity, and glycogen transporters. All of these are more than likely to make you much faster at endurance cycling. So to conclude, ride hard if you want to, there's some great benefits, but steady riding can make a massive difference to how fit and how fast you can ride, and you can get fast by riding hard way less often than you think. You can't get fit on an e-bike. What? There seems to be some strange anti-e-bike people out there in the world. I don't get it. Why, why would you be against e-bikes? They, they're great, they get more people riding bikes, and that's what we all want. Well, at least me and Francis do. Firstly, despite it being an e-bike, you do have to still pedal. Some people think that you don't. Well, if you didn't pedal, then it's technically not a bike. It'd be a moped or an electric motorbike, which I think in some places is illegal, but not in the United Kingdom. Secondly, e-bikes cut out at 24 kilometers per hour. So if you're going down a hill, you're doing all of the work. If you're going up a hill, you're getting some assistance and on some of the flat, you're probably also doing all of the work. So you're not always getting benefit from the motor. A point that Francis made earlier, and it's relevant here as well, is volume is more important than intensity. What the e-bike might do is get people out riding more often where perhaps they go, oh, I'm feeling a bit tired today, or those hills that I live around are a bit too hilly for me to venture against. Whereas I have my e-bike, so you go, well, I know I'm gonna be able to get up them, so I'm still gonna get out and have a good time on my bike. So you're gonna get more volume. Particularly if you're commuting or just using your bike to go to the shops, take the kids to school, that kind of thing. If you've got an e-bike, you're more likely to go, well, this isn't a burden. I'm gonna grab that bike and get it done. You get some exercise. The world is slightly cleaner for it. You just need to look at how popular things like line bikes are. There's loads of them in London these days, and I'm sure many other cities around the world. They just make cycling more accessible. More rides means more volume, which means more simple. More, simple. <laughs> more rides means more volume, which means more fitness. Simple. It's that simple. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. See you at the next one. If there's a bike lane, you have to ride in it. This one's for the UK viewers. If you live here, you don't have to ride in a bike lane if there's one painted on the side of the road. Sometimes they're great, but more often than not, they are indirect, covered in crap, full of potholes. They've got loads of driveways halfway through them, or even delivery drivers parking their vans in the way. Thankfully, by law, you don't have to use them. You're fully entitled to use the road, as long as it's not a motorway. If you feel safer using a bike lane, however, go for it. There are some fantastic ones being built, particularly the segregated cycle lanes, which are fully separate from the road. Hopefully, we'll start seeing more of these in years to come. Crashed carbon is a write-off. I don't know why everyone thinks crit bikes should be made of aluminium, because if you crash one of those and crack it, it's f Whereas a carbon frame, or wheel, or handlebar, can generally be repaired, just like they repair sailboats. I've had some pretty impressive carbon repairs done on personal bikes, one which was destroyed by an airline, or the baggage handler, in multiple places. And the company I used charged me 200 pounds to repair multiple pieces of damage on my expensive carbon frame. Whilst you used to have to find someone doing repairs out of a shed, there's now a few professional companies that have set up, namely Carbon Bike Repair, who we've had on this channel before. The process usually involves sanding down the damaged area, adding material, carbon fiber sheets, using epoxy to bind them all together, and then sanding it again so you can barely see the repair. It can even be repainted over the top to look as good as new. A repaired area will usually be slightly heavier than it originally was, but we're talking a few grams, and allegedly stronger than it was in the first place. I love this idea because recycling is good, and often bike racing can lead to crashes. So get some more life out of your carbon parts, and it's a win-win-win. Win. 90 revolutions per minute cadence is best. I don't know where this one came from, but if you join a cycling club, this is what everyone says. Studies looking into cadence on the bike, their conclusions conflict drastically. So what we can safely speculate is that cadence is personal. It's not always best to look at pro riders, but in this case, because it's easy, we will. Look at Chris Froome's cadence. It's massively fast, and he won multiple Grand Tours and was one of the best cyclists in the world for a decent portion of time. And now look at Burt Grapsch, world time trial champion, and he had 
special chain rings fitted to his bike so he can pedal even slower. Absolute captain cadence. My suggestion would be to try different styles and see what works for you, but at the end of the day, you're probably gonna end up slipping into your preferred cadence anyway. You can find your saddle height by measuring your inseam, or the COPS method, or one of these formulaic methods which tries to give you a value for how high your saddle should be, and they always end up wrong. There's a bunch of different methods, but frankly, for some people, they can lead to wildly incorrect saddle heights, which can cause injury. You're better off grabbing a camera, your phone will do, and filming yourself pedaling indoors. What you're looking for is smoothness and fluidity through the bottom of the stroke. You don't want your feet to be snapping at the bottom of the stroke either. That would indicate your saddle's too high. Or you could end up listing over to one side to compensate, which leads to saddle sores. That's why saddle sores tend to end up being just on one side. If it's too low, you'll impinge your hips, cause pain, and you won't be able to put much power out. If you're having any of the issues associated with excessive saddle height, so neck pain, knee pain, saddle problems, genital numbness, saddle sores, hand pain, and you suspect your saddle might be too high, then lower it by 30 mil, three centimeters. A big amount, and then work your way back up from there. Bike fitting is a game of centimeters rather than millimeters, so making really tiny incremental changes probably isn't gonna make much difference. That marks the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any cycling myths that you've heard in the club, put them in the comment section down below. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and see you guys soon.